Smoke Pit Fairy Tales by Trip Ainsworth. Chapter 6. Mola Pin, Arrows, Statues, and Chessboards. The tanks finally showed up. Well, they showed up somewhere. I didn't see any of them. Fox Company and Cat One started crawling across the small park to the buildings on the other side. Coomer grabbed the radio. INCOMING! Mortar rounds hurled to the pavement. The line company marines hit the deck and crawled for cover. Hofstetter put the truck in reverse and punched the gas. Something held the tires back. We couldn't move. Hofstetter barked at the vehicle. God damn it! Then we dropped it. It felt like the ground beneath the rear of the vehicle gave way. I looked out the back window and saw that it had. The road behind us started to crack and splinter. Every time Hoff hit the gas, we sunk a bit more. Mortars exploded around us. They had us zeroed in. The truck made another loud bang and fell a few feet deep. Everyone in the vehicle grabbed something to hold on to. The truck tilted backwards. The front end rose in the air. We fell another foot, then another. The truck plummeted into the hole in the ground. We flipped, rolled, and smashed. The Marines on the inside were thrown into each other. We were finally still. The vehicle was upside down with its nose in the air. The Marines in the front seats were jammed into the front windows. Everyone in the back was pretzeled into a pile on the ceiling, which was now the floor. We all groaned. Is everybody okay? Fields wheezed as he made an attempt to free himself from the mound. We only offered him moans. Alvarado shrugged free and said, Motherfucker, that hurt! He reached out and grabbed the back door's handle and pulled himself to the window. He peered out. I think there's an opening back here. Can you open the door? Doc winced. Alvarado turned the handle and pushed. The heavy door swung open. Yeah. He rolled out of the truck into the shadows and dust. He turned back, stuck his arm back in, and pulled out Reyes. Fields, Doc, and I followed them out. We fell somewhere dark. Fields flipped on the flashlight attached to his weapon and scanned the area. Yeah, turn on your flashlights. We were in a room about the size of a 20-car garage. The walls were built of large marble stones. I took a few steps into the expanse, shining my light over the area. There were 12 columns bearing the weight of the ceiling, evenly spread in a circle. Each one of them was carved into some sort of nightmarish half-man, half-scorpion monster. There was one large door in the center of the three walls. The place gave me the creeps. I felt a heavy presence upon me. My skin walked, and ice filled my spine. I looked back to where we entered. Doc had climbed back into the truck to pull out the other three Marines. First came Hofstetter, then Coomer. Then Doc came back with a sick look on his face. What's up, Doc? Doc walked over to the columns and sat down. Sandinson's fucking crushed. There isn't much left of him above his waist. I pulled out a cigarette and handed it to Doc. Thanks, bro. He brushed the dust off his shoulders and arms. You got a lighter? Yeah. I extended my hand, flicking my light open. No one said anything until Coomer came back out of the truck. He had a grim look with Sanderson's dog tags and kill cards in his hand. Looking up through the window, it doesn't look like we'd be able to climb out unless we broke through the glass. And that's ballistic. Yeah. So we can either try to blow them out and risk burning ourselves to death or burying us further, or try to find another way through all this. He pointed at the door on the other side of the room. Sergeant, what about Sanderson? Hofstetter asked. Doc interrupted before Coomer could answer. The way he's wedged in there, we'd have to rip him apart to get him out. He's hamburger above the belt. And if we leave him in there, they'll recover his body when they come to dig up the truck. They're not just going to leave it down here. So? Said Alvarado. Are we going to wait here for the rescue party or try to find another way out? Alright. We're going to try to get through, well, whatever the hell we are. Everyone check your chow water and ammo. As we looked over our gear, Fields shot his head up. Oh yeah, no shit! What's up? I looked at him confused. Fields pressed the button down on his radio. Any station, any station, it's Cat 1 Bravo. Oh, yeah, no, no shit. shit, why not try using the radio? Any station, any station, this is Cat 1 Bravo, do you read? There was nothing but a faint hiss. Well, so fucking much for that idea. Fields put his eyes on the room. You all look around for a way out. I'm going to burn all the sensitive gear in the truck. Fields climbed back into the truck to yank out the other radios, maps, and anything else that should have been left lying around for the wrong hands to find. Coomer, Alvarado, Reyes, Hofstetter, Doc, and I searched the room. I took a closer look at the statues with the light of my rifle. 
They were expertly carved out of a milky white marble. I thought to myself that if we got out of this place and if I made it through this war and got home and somehow became a rock star, I was totally going to put this room on an album cover. It was scary, but it was fucking metal. Looking up at the heads of the statues, I noticed that there was something in the middle of the ceiling. It was a carving of a moon. I walked to the perimeter of the room. The walls were engraved, floor to roof and cuneiform. The other marines were inspecting the door. It had a golden frame and the door itself looked like as if it were made from bronze. It simply pushed open, but no one went through. We returned to the truck. Fields had pulled out everything he felt the need to, put it in a pile and poured fuel over it. He pulled out our battle colors, the Jolly Roger, and put that in his pack. Gents, it's a bit chilly down here. Smoke them if you got them. He lit his empty cigarette box and threw it onto the pile of radios, maps, manuals, and such. The Marines who smoked did. When the fire had burned its way to a smoldering heap of melted plastic and metal, we spread the ashes and gunk that was left to form an arrow in the direction we were going and headed through the door. As soon as the six of us entered, the door slammed shut. We all turned to the door and frankly tried to unlodge it, but it was no use. That door was staying closed. Sergeant Coomer said, trying to keep himself calm. Okay, everybody, just stay chill and look around the room and see what else is in here. Hopefully, there's another way out. We turned to the room. It was darker than the last one. It was a good thing we had our lights. At first glance, it looked exactly like the first room. It was the same size and shape with the same 12 scorpion men holding up the roof. I walked through the pillars to the center of the room. There were grooves on the floor. Not grooves like scratches from sliding something heavy but as if the architect put them there on purpose. There were also seven smaller scorpion men in the room. These ones were only six feet tall and placed with no pattern at all. And there was another door on the far end of the room, just like the last one, only it didn't open from this side. Hey guys? A worried voice called from near the other side of the room. We came to find Alvarado standing over several skeletons. They were all dressed in ancient armor, brandishing swords and shields. They were positioned as if they had very non-violent deaths. This isn't good. This isn't good at all. Fields took his flashlight off the skeletons. Nobody freak out. Just keep looking for some. A few hours went by. Doc looked at the walls trying to read the extinct language. He couldn't even begin to understand, but maybe he thought there was something. Coomer and Fields inspected the statues, both big and small. Alvarado and Reyes tried to pry the far door. The one we didn't enter. No luck. I leaned over to Doc and said, Hey. Yeah, man? Those bones. What about them? They look like they starved to death and just curled up and died. Don't remind me. Doc ran his fingers over the etches in the wall. You got any chow on you? Nah, man, I don't. Great. No one had given up yet, but Reyes and Alvarado took a break and rested on the small scorpion pillars. Reyes mumbled to his doll that was still in his flak jacket. I know. Yes, I did think of that, and no, it did not work. Not now. No. Barbara, leave me alone. If that's the way you feel about it, then maybe you shouldn't have come along. Barbara. Bar- Shut the fuck up, Barbara! Hey! Alvarado leaned in on Reyes. Dude, are you okay? What do you think? Reyes bit back. Dude, I know it's shitty, but we gotta hang in there and keep our heads straight. Alvarado continued to console Reyes. I looked over to Doc. Dude, I have a question. Yeah? Why haven't we ran out of oxygen yet? I don't know. I think he thought I was trying to fuck with him. No, no, seriously, this room's not that big. I turned my light to the corners of the ceiling, trying to find fence or shafts or something else to bring in air. If it brought air in, it could lead us out. And that's when I saw it. There was a carving on this roof, too. It was of seven identical women holding hands side by side. Hey, look at this! Coomer, Fields, Doc, and Hofstetter all pointed their lights to the ceiling. It reminds me of Pleiades, Doc said as he studied the carving. And what's that, Doc? It's a constellation. It's supposed to be seven sister handmaidens or some shit. I'm into that kind of thing. Stars or seven naked women? <laughs> Both. So what the hell does it mean? Hofstetter asked. No one answered. Alvarado and Reyes' conversation transformed into a fight. Alvarado lifted Reyes by his shoulder harness on his flak and pushed him into the scorpion statue, yelling, Hey, step out of it! When Reyes hit the statue, it rolled a foot or two across the floor. Everyone went silent. Coomer let out a deep sigh. Ugh. Are you assholes telling me that no one bothered to check the statues? Everyone avoided making eye contact with him out of shame. 
Fields looked around. Okay, so we got seven sister stars and these statues. Doc, do you know what the constellation is supposed to look like? Uh, yeah, actually. We'll get to it! Doc went to each of the statues, pushing them with relative ease along the grooves in the floor until they made a pattern that resembled the constellation. Then, inside the door we didn't enter, a lever emerged on each side. The lever on the left was made out of silver, and a large red ruby sat on its top. The other lever was made of gold with a large round ball of jade. Doc walked to the door and pulled the red lever. The statues all rumbled, the room shook, and the scorpion man statues rolled back to their original positions, and the levers disappeared behind the walls. I yelled at Doc. A great job, jackass! Hey, fuck you, dude! Stop it! Doc, put the statues back and pull the other lever. Doc pushed them back, and once again, the levers dropped back out of the wall. This time, Doc pulled the green one, and the door opened. Hold on a minute. What if that door closes, too? Hofstetter said before anyone could go through the opening. Well, we won't be any better off than if it stays open. Yeah, but should a pair of us stay back in here? No. We're sticking together. All of us. If the door closes and there's something fucked up in the next room, it would be better to have more marines. Also, the buddy system and blah, 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 blah. Doc turned and led the way through the threshold. The moment all of us were inside, the back door slammed shut. Told ya. Hofstetter scoffed. Fields just grunted at him. This room was just as dark as the last. It had the same 12 statues in the same 12 places and another door on the other end. This room, however, didn't have the small statues in the middle. In the very center, there was a pillar. It was about four feet tall with a flat top and what looked like a chessboard with 19 little scorpion man pieces. We figured the puzzle had to be similar to the previous one. We looked at the ceiling and there was a bull. Taurus. Doc arranged the pieces to form the constellation. and Just like the last room, two levers popped out. When the green one was pulled, the door opened. When we all passed through the door, it closed. The next room again was just the same as the first. Hell, for half a second, I thought it was the first. We saw the seven man-sized scorpion men statues and looked up. This one was odd. It was a shepherd with a very sad, lost, and confused look on his face. Yeah, I don't know what this one is. Doc muttered. Well, there are seven scorpion dudes. I lit a cigarette. So, a constellation with seven stars. The Big Dipper has seven stars. Yeah, well, fuck it, why not? If we're wrong, we can try again. Doc pushed the stone monsters into the position of the Big Dipper and the levers popped out just as they had in the previous rooms. Doc walked over and pulled down the green handle. There was a metallic thwing and an arrow shot into the back of Doc's left shoulder. Doc screamed and fell. The rest of us ran to him. He was squirming on the ground trying to reach the arrow with his other hand. Be still, damn it! Coomer shouted, trying to get a better look at Doc. Reyes, Alvarado, shine some light on him. Hoff, Allensworth, hold him down. Coomer said while looking down at Doc's wound. Oh, this ain't too bad. Doc, calm down. Your flax stopped it from going all the way through. The arrow was only about an inch in. Coomer ripped the arrow out and Doc let out a howl. The flak jacket he was wearing, the one we were all wearing, was a thick vest with Kevlar inserts to stop bullets at shrapnel. The arrow hit the part by the edge that the Kevlar plate didn't cover. It was still enough to keep the arrow from going through. Doc laid panting. This is going to sting a bit, Doc. Coomer cut a hole in the shoulder of Doc's uniform. After he made a decent enough size slit, Coomer poured quick clot into the dime size hole in Doc's back. Doc screamed. We leaned Doc on the wall and gave him some water. Doc, I said to get his attention. I'm alright, man. It wasn't the Big Dipper. Yeah, no shit. He looked up to Fields and Coomer laughing. Do I get another purple heart for this? Uh. Doc rubbed his forehead. His hands ran into his helmet. Why the fuck are we wearing these? Fields said. Yeah, if you want to, if you guys want to pop your tops, put them in your packs. We took off our helmets and stuffed them inside our bags or strapped them to the side. After a few minutes of recovery, Doc stood back up and re-examined the statues on the floor. Seven and not the Big Dipper. He looked up to the shepherd on the ceiling. Uh, that's stupid. What does that have to do with the shepherd? He looked over to me. Thanks for getting me shot, asshole. Oh, that's what I'm here for, man. Dick. I'll buy you a six-pack when we get back. At least for some damn reason, our spirits were up a little. I was just happy Doc was okay. Must be Orion? Doc went back to pushing the statues, this time into Orion. The door crept up. We entered the next room, yet again the same looking room with the chess table. When we got through, the back door again slammed. We looked to the mural of the ceiling first. There was a hunched over old man with a cane and a raggedy beard. Motherfucker. When we got to the pillar with the pieces, Doc exclaimed, Oh, fuck me! What? We said worried. 
damn it! God damn it! What? Why? Gathering around the table, we counted 19 little Scorpion Man statues on the board and shared Doc's dread. Any ideas? Coomer asked him. I... Doc scratched his head. It might be Perseus? He looked to the carving on the ceiling. What the fuck does that have to do with an old man? Well, Perseus is a Greek name, and this place is probably a hell of a lot older than Greece. Try it and pull the levers from the side, in case it's not right. Doc sighed and started moving the little figures around. <sighs> I don't remember where this star goes. Coomer said in a calm voice. Okay. Put it where you think it may go, then pull the lever from the other side like Sergeant Fields said. And if it's wrong, try it again. Doc put the last statuette in one of the places on the board and walked to the levers that came out from the wall. He stood by the green one and carefully from the side pulled it down. An arrow shot through the dark and stuck in the wall a foot away from Doc's head and the levers disappeared back into the walls. Doc cursed the room. He came back to the pillar and arranged the constellation again to his best guess. The levers came back down, and again, Doc stood to the side and pulled the green one. Instead of the arrow, or the door opening, about a quarter of the floor fell from beneath us. Coomer fell down into the pit with the marble tiles. We ran to where he had been standing, cautiously avoiding the gaps in the floor and crying his name. We looked down and saw only black. We shined our lights to find him. There was nothing but the void. We called to him, and there was no response. Not even our echoes talked. Tears fell down from the side of Field's face. He took an empty magazine from a pouch and tossed it in to see how far it led. There was no echo. Arrows and pits, you gotta be fucking kidding me. Doc, you better goddamn get it right this time. Doc went back to the table. He made another guess at the locations of the stars. When the levers appeared, he grabbed the green one once more, fearing for what would happen next. He pulled it down and the door opened. He let out a great sigh of relief. Silently, the rest of us walked into the next room. Once more, the door locked and there were statues and cuts in the floor. We looked up to see a scimitar. I don't know what that is. We just glared at him. I mean, I know it's a sword. He looked around and counted the statues. And there are seven stars in the constellation. It can only be Ares or Origa. And since it's a sword and not a goat, I'm going with Origa. And what if you're wrong? Alvarado growled. Well, do you want to do it? I don't know any of this shit. Then shut the fuck up. Alvarado was angry, but stayed silent. Origa was right. Doc also guessed correctly the next two rooms, Gemini and Cancer, although Cancer was a crayfish. All the rooms were still identical from the last, except for the carvings on the roof and the variation between statues and chessboards. The next room had a lion on the ceiling and 15 little scorpion man pieces. It's Leo. All right then, Doc. Let's go. Doc looked pale and sweaty. His skin was clammy. Yeah, just give me a minute. You all right? I asked him. I don't know, man. I feel like shit. There might have been something on that arrow. We all looked at Doc. I think I'll be okay for a bit. He swallowed a few pills from his med bag. He stood up and made the figurines into the shape of Leo. And the lever opened the door. The following chamber had 15 pieces on the board and a plow carving. Doc was stumped and starting to get sick. We proceeded with extreme caution. The first try didn't work and the arrow missed Doc when it flew. Before the second try, everyone held their arms around a column so if the floor fell from beneath us then maybe we wouldn't fall. Doc pulled the lever again after rearranging the constellation. Tiles from the floor fell into infinity, but none of the marines fell. The tiles below Fields and me fell, but since we had lashed ourselves to the big scorpion men, we could make our way to more stable ground. Doc tried the whole ordeal again. Six of the big scorpion columns swung down their heads so fast that no one knew what happened until it was over. Fields started screaming. We made our way to him. His arm was caught crushed under one of the column statues. She, what do we do? Reyes grabbed at his hair. Hostetter started pulling at the statue's hand, trying to lift it off of Field's arm. Guys, help me! Reyes, Doc, and I joined Hofstetter in trying to lift the giant stone hand. We pulled and yanked with all of our might, but our efforts were fruitless. Damn it. Reyes punched the statue. Field screamed in pain. Doc knelt down next to him and gave him a shot of morphine. Field's screams turned into a subtle growl. Doc sat there with a terrible look of hopelessness on his face. We stood around Fields, silently brooding over our predicament. We were at our breaking point. No one said anything for a long time until Reyes, who had made his way to the foot of the statue and sat, started talking again to that fucking doll. Ja, it's shitty. You're not helping Barbara. What does that have to do with anything? Ja, he's... he's... Where is he? Where is he? Reyes looked up at us. Where's Alvarado? Hofstetter, Doc, and I looked at each other in confusion. Alvarado! Alvarado! Where the fuck are you? He didn't answer. We looked for him, being careful not to fall into the pit. 
We found what was left. His arm laid palm up from under one of the statue's hands in a pool of his blood. Reyes curled up in a ball next to him and wept. He cried, No, no, bro. God damn it, man, no! His tears were bitter with curses. Hofstetter, Doc, and I crept back to Fields to give Reyes a minute alone. Alvarado had been Reyes' best friend, and Fields was unconscious. So, what do we do? Try the constellation again. But what if I miss? What'll happen? What about him? I pointed to Fields. Well, we have to do something. He looked over to Reyes. Doc, try the puzzle again. If it works, I'll stay with Fields. And probably Reyes, while you two go ahead. If you get out, then bring engineers down here and blow away the walls until you find us. And what if I get it wrong again and something worse happens? Then Doc, we'll be dead and won't have to deal with this shit. Hopefully. I wouldn't be surprised if it's wrong and Medusas and demons come out. Doc looked over at the chess table pillar. I don't feel right about leaving anyone behind. Put it on, Doc. Fields groaned from below. We looked down to him. Get the damn thing off and we'll get out of here. Doc glared at Fields. I'm not cutting off your arm. Yeah? How about I, fucking sergeant? I'll take my chances of standing in front of the CO later. Doc leaned down. I'm not cutting off your arm. Fields huffed at him. Not knowing exactly what to do, Doc walked over to the table again and played with the pieces. When he had set them all, the levers once again came down and he pulled the green one. The door opened. What was it? Virgo. The two of them stood in the doorway debating what course of action to take. I went to Reyes. Hey man. Reyes held Alvarado's hand. Yeah? I, I think Doc and I are going to keep going and come back with help. Hoff is going to stay here with Fields. Do you want to come with us or stay with Hoff? I'm going to stay here with Alvarado. Okay. They patted his shoulder and walked over to Doc and Hoff. So what's the deal? Doc said with a frown. We don't know. We're going to flip a coin. Oh, well, that's a great fucking idea. Well, what the fuck do you suggest? Not that! You're not helping, Kodak. Shut up! Do you even have coins? I clenched my fist. Fields' voice interrupted us. We can all go. The three of us turned to see him standing there. His K-bar was in one hand, and the other was ten feet behind him under the statue. Sit down! Doc ordered. Fields complied. Doc started swearing through dressing Fields' self-inflicted injury. When Doc was done, Fields opened his mouth to say something. Doc cut him off. I don't want to hear a damn word from you. He turned to Hofstetter and said, Go get Reese. I pulled Fields' good arm over my shoulder and helped him to his feet. The next room was Libra. Easy. There were scales on the ceiling. Scorpio was next, then Sagittarius, Aquarius, and Pisces. Every room was set up near identically. The next room's constellation was unknown with seven stars, but Doc guessed it correctly the first time. We entered the next room. Doc was breathing heavily and sweating profusely, despite how cold the air was down there. There was probably poison in that arrow. He leaned against one of the columns in the room and vomited. I ran to help him, with Fields still hobbling over my shoulder. Doc, you alright? Yeah, I'm good. He spit up more, then took a small sip from his canteen. Doc staggered to the pillar in the middle of the room. He leaned over it with one hand on each side of the board. He stared at it blankly for a few moments, and then fell over. I sat Fields down and ran to Doc with Hofstetter and Reyes. Doc! I'm alive. Are you that sick? I knew that he was. I knelt down to him and gave him some more water. No, I'm not that sick. He put his hands over his face. But this is too much. Doc started to sob. I felt terrible. I hated seeing my friends in pain, but watching them cry, especially in an already shitty situation, made me feel weak and helpless. Doc, come on. I have faith in you. I wanted to cry too. He shook his head and wept. It can't be that bad. We only have like Aries left, right? I looked up to the carving on the ceiling and there was a great stag dancing around a meadow. I mean, that's not Aries, but a goat and a deer kind of look the same. I mean, they both have horns. Then I saw what upset Doc so terribly. The chessboard with the scorpion man pieces. 34. 34? What fucking constellation has 34 fucking stars? What the fucking fuck is this fucking horse shit? I couldn't help it anymore either. I started to cry. I was sure there was no way out. We were going to die down there. Just starve to death like those skeletons in the other room who hadn't made it past the first door, or make an attempt at the unknown and be stabbed, crushed for flattened to death. Fuck my life! I started to envy Reyes. He had a damn doll as an outlet for his foundering mind. Hofstetter and Reyes weren't in quite as bad shape as Doc and I were, but the sun was nowhere near them either. You bitches quit crying like pussies and get up! Fields scolded us. He walked past us almost in a trance and started playing with the chess pieces. Those demons on the pillar. Doc, if you don't have a hint and insist on being a vagina about it, then fuck it, I'll guess. 
He finished arranging the constellation as he pleased and walked over to the levers. Remembering the arrows, he stood to the side. When he pulled the arrow, the arrow struck beside him and the levers disappeared. And Fields again walked to the pillar to try again. Everyone, grab some in case this doesn't work out. It didn't work. Half the floor fell out from beneath us. Get behind the statues along the outer wall so that you don't get smashed and I'm wrong again. The statue's arm swung down and would have killed people in half the places in the middle of the room. Field swore and returned to the pillar. Doc, I, I, I don't think that whoever built this thought about people being along the walls. Doc, looking pale and sickly, managed to hack up. Uh, yeah. He looked down the boundaries of the room. None of the floor had fallen out and nothing was smashed. I don't know what's next, gents. When Fields pulled the next lever, six of the stone columns crumbled into boulders and fell to the ground. Some of the boulders were big enough to cover the pits in the floor. One of the columns mangled Hofstetter's body, leaving him lifeless. Another pinned Reyes' leg to the floor. Reyes yelped. We climbed to him through the new terrain the rubble had built and over the pits in the floor that were left. I'm sure they led all the way to hell. You're not cutting off my fucking leg, Doc. I didn't cut off his arm! Fields went back to the table, rearranged the pieces, and pulled the lever again. There was a loud bang and the sound of grinding rocks. I looked up at it with my light. The roof was sliding down on us. You gotta be fucking kidding me. Fields tried again at the scorpion chest. You don't have time for this, Doc. Go over there and pull the lever when I tell you to. He tried another combination. Doc pulled the lever. Nothing happened. What's going on? Doc shouted. I don't know, but I hear something. Is that a free one? I shined my light around the room. Fuck. There's water coming down the walls. Everyone started to panic. The water was running down fast. A decent amount of it was falling into the pits, but the wreckage of the statues covered enough of them to let the water build up. Another try. Long metal spikes extended themselves from the ceiling. Water rose around my ankles. The spikes were still 30 feet away. They were slow, but they were coming. Reyes couldn't get up. The crumbled statue pinned him to the floor. The murky, sand-ridden liquid covered his face. The stones didn't budge when I kicked or pushed them. I tried to pull him so he could get air. Oh, no, no! Reyes stared at me from under the water. He was too panicked to hold his breath. Bubbles escaped his mouth as he tried to scream. I'm sorry! He started to cry again. I pulled, yanked, shoved, and pushed Reyes in the rocks. Nothing would budge. I'm sorry! Reyes lay crushed under the demonic ruins. The last of his air left him. I wiped my eyes with my sleeve. Fuck! Fields reorganized the pieces. Doc? Doc pulled the lever and twelve spears shot out from the floor around the pillar in the center of the room in paling fields. He was propped up dead where he stood. I climbed and swam over to the chessboard and stuck my hand through the spears and moved a piece. I called Doc and when he pulled the lever, the roof engulfed in the flame. Fuck! 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 I moved another piece around. I called to Doc. The spikes were ten feet away and the water was up to my chest. Doc pulled the lever and the door opened. The water rushed out of the room from the floor but still poured from the walls. The roof was still burning and falling. I waited as quickly as I could to the door. Doc and I left the room. Then the door slammed shut. Jesus, God! Fuck! I tried to catch my breath. When we got to the middle of the room, there were more statues. Doc kneeled over and vomited. I rested him on one of the twelve pillars. I looked up. This room was a man working a field. I didn't know what the modern constellation translation was, but there were nine statues on the ground, and we hadn't done Aries yet, so I decided to try it. I only knew four constellations. The Big Dipper, Orion, the Southern Cross, and Ares. I pushed the statues into the right places, and when the lever appeared, I pulled the green one. The door opened and light shined out of the room. It was very dim light, but it was light, damn it. I ran over to Doc. He was in a poor state. He couldn't hold his head up and was pale. I grabbed him by the shoulder straps of his flak jacket and dragged him across the floor to the other room. The door stayed open when we went through. This room was a great hall. We stood on a platform made from the same marble as the rest of the dungeon or temple or wherever the fuck we were. Before us, there was a long pool filled with mercury. There was a forest in the room. It stretched from the back wall of the platform with us across the mercury lake to the other end. It looked as if it was shorter than a hundred yards away. There was a giant stone statue of a warrior holding an axe at the position of attention as if he were guarding the room. The dim light that illuminated the room came from an opening in the wall on the far side. I didn't know how deep the mercury was, but if it were more than half an inch, I wasn't going to walk through it. I took the axe out of the statue's hand and pushed the statue into the lake. The mercury didn't splash up, but that stone sank. There was no telling how deep it was. Doc was lying on the deck by the back wall. He was still breathing, but it was faint. He was destroyed. I looked at the axe I took from the statue, and then at the trees. I started as close to the edge of the platform as I could and cut down the trees. After the first tree fell, I placed it horizontally on the lake. I hacked down more of the trees and shoved them into the lake. I tried to be quick. 
Most of them weren't too thick and only required three or four swings to topple. I didn't count how many I took down, but it had to be at least 120 before there was enough of a bridge to where I felt comfortable taking Doc across. First, I tested it by walking halfway across the lake on the timbers. They were a bit wobbly, but it held. I went back and grabbed Doc. I put his arm over my shoulder and half walked, half drug him across the bridge to the light on the other side. There was a platform on the other side too, and another statue with an axe and a door which bright light shined through. When we came through the doorless threshold, I cried for joy. The ceiling was as brilliantly blinding as the sun. The hall was great, and it was easily larger than a department store. It was warm, and there were trees, bushes, and flowers, and grass bordering the walls. The floor was all one giant crystal that was so clear I could see through it until the light faded away. There were two streams of running water on the edge of the plant life, and there were riches. Rich jewels, gems, and treasure. Piles and piles of gold and silver and rubies everywhere. No, no wonder it had been so, so damn difficult, difficult to get here. I laid Doc by one of the streams and cupped him some water. He was only strong enough to drink in little bits. I went to explore the room for a way out or anything that may have bettered Doc's ailments. On the walls above the trees were murals of what looked to be Noah's Ark. Lines of animals and the beasts of the earth lined up two by two, following a bearded man with a staff into a ship. At the far end of the room was a giant cobalt gate. There were golden reliefs of dragons and lions. On top of the gate were two large silver-winged bulls with human heads and long beards. In the middle of the gateway was a golden statue of a man with a square beard. He stood on top of a ship that looked like the Ark from the Flood Myths. The streams in the room came in as one from the mouth of the gate and split at the statue. In his right hand he held a rod with two snakes wrapped around it. His left hand was pointing into the stream to that side of him. I followed his hand. In the water there was a large plant growing out of the floor. The plant was green and lush. There were purple flowers on it with five petals. It was covered in long thorns. I got down on my hands and knees to see a bit more clearly. I wasn't a botanist, but I'm pretty sure flowers aren't supposed to grow underwater. That's when I saw the berries. Big, red berries. They were just a little larger than the big lights my grandma used to have on her Christmas tree. I didn't exactly know at the time what the statue of Noah meant by holding the cadices and pointing to that bush with the red, fleshy berries on it. But if I had known, I wouldn't have gotten into it. I would have just stayed there and died, but that's a story for later. Much, much later. However, at the time, the statue was holding the cadices and pointing to something edible, and Doc was sick. I took it as a blatant sign. I took my gear, clothes, and boots off and jumped in. I swam down, but I couldn't hold my breath long enough to get all the way down and back up. I tried a few times, failing each one. I climbed out of the water and searched the room for something to help me. I found a heavy red ruby, about the size of a basketball, and took it to the stream. I stuck my K-bar in its sheath under my armpit to hold onto it, grabbed the ruby, and jumped in the water. I sank like a rock. When I got to where I thought I needed to be, I let go of the precious stone and cut off the branch with the most berries on it. Ascending water is a lot easier than going down. I put my trousers back on and took the branch to Doc. He looked like death. I picked his head up and fed him one of the large, fleshy red berries. He managed to get it down. After he had eaten two or three, I put him back on his back. Then I ate one for myself. They tasted like better than anything I'd ever eaten. Their flavor was like a cool raspberry and a pomegranate mixed with a sunny afternoon. They had some seeds in them, but they were small. I sat there for about half an hour, admiring the hall and all of its beauty. What is this place? Who built it? And why? It made me think of what would have happened if Alibaba had hidden his treasures in the Garden of Eden. I grabbed my gear and clothes and brought them over to where Doc was laying. There were still almost 50 berries on the branch I brought up. I ate a few more. I sat on the ledge and put my feet in the water and looked at the images on the wall of the animals loading into the ark. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw something move. I snapped around to see a snake curling around the branch. I picked up my M4 and smashed its head with a buttstock. How the fuck did that get down here? Huh? Doc said, waking up. How you feeling, buddy? Doc sat up and rubbed his face. I'm actually feeling pretty good. Not sick or anything? Kind of surprised. You look like death. Yeah. Doc looked around the room. Where the fuck are we? I don't remember anything after the room where the statues fell down. There were a few more rooms, man. He looked at me stone-faced. But they ended up being the easy ones. Huh. Doc stood up and dropped his pack and flak jacket. He walked around the room, dressed as I had, astonished at the marvel of the place. Look at all this gold! No wonder it was fucking guarded like that. I stood up and walked with him. He saw the golden statue at the mouth of the rivers under the great gate in the room. Is that Noah? Best I can guess. He's got Caduceus. That's totally badass. Doc looked into the water where the statue was gesturing. Is that where you got the sweets? Yeah. 
We spent a good amount of time investigating the hall with all of its great treasure. We grabbed the berry branch and sat down in front of the golden statue and ate the rest of the Christmas light looking little red fruits. Doc said, Dude, I feel great. I don't know if that poison was just short term, or if it's the berries, or if it's just that I'm not in the dark anymore, or what? Yeah, I don't know, man. I actually feel pretty good, too. At least physically. Doc frowned. God rest their souls. We didn't talk for a while. I finally broke the silence. So how about we try to get the hell out of here? I'm on board with that. What about all the loot? Doc pointed to the gold and gems. I don't know about that, man. It's down here for a reason. Doc eyed the treasure. But there's so damn much of it. And after what we paid to get in here. Yeah, but that's the thing, man. What if it's cursed or booby-trapped or some other shit like the rest of this godforsaken place? This room seems pretty alright to me. Yeah, I killed a snake in here if you didn't see that. Gross. And besides that, don't you remember like every mummy or pirate or treasure movie ever made? That shit's bad juju. I'm telling you, man, it's down here and guarded like that for a reason. But we made it past the test and traps. Doc, listen to me. You ever read up on Norse mythology? Not really. In all their old stories, there's treasure, and nothing ever good happens to the people who have it. You know what? As a matter of fact, I, I think it was all the same treasure in that it was cursed and made all the bad shit happen. It may have just been an analogy, but the greed of the gold turned Loki from a trickster to a devil. It made the brothers kill their fathers and then each other, and it made the gods go to war with the dwarves, and it made Sleeping Beauty kill the guy who saved her from the castle. Sleeping Beauty was a viking? Y yeah, but th that's not the point. I don't know if that gold's evil or not, but I don't want to risk it. And I don't want to take the wrong pieces and have mummies burst out of the walls and eat me. After all that other bullshit today, I'm more than willing to believe that, that kind of fucked up shit could happen. Mummies or hydras or flying fucking monkeys. They're just going to pop out of the walls and cut our balls off with dull, rusty daggers and stuff them in our mouths and fist fuck us while they stab us in the eyes with forks. A worried look grew on Doc's face. Yeah, you're probably right about that. Think about it. When has anyone ever taken treasure out of a horde and had a happy ending? None that I can think of, man. So we're going to leave it? Yeah. Good. I stood up. Let's get our shit together and try to get the fuck out of this place. We gathered what we had brought in and absolutely nothing more, except the berries in our guts, and headed to the door. We walked over to the Mercury Lake and into the Ares room. When we got to the door at the back of the room, now in the front, it slid itself open. Why the fuck didn't it do that before? Probably because we're coming from the other side. The next room was depressing and frightening. The ceiling was so low and the rubble was so high that we had to crawl through. The water was drained, but everything was scorched and black. We crossed by fields. He was hard to look at. He wasn't much more than a skeleton. It put a sick feeling in my gut. I shined my light forward. I didn't want to look at him any more than I had to. After that room, Doc and I walked through the rest of the dungeon. The doors opened for us, and we cut through the darkness and the cold. We did, of course, keep our eyes out for holes in the ground. When we got back to the room through which we first entered, that dreary pit of death, the truck was gone and there was a tunnel leading up to where it had fallen. There was a thunderous boom. The scorpion man columns collapsed and everything came crashing to the ground. Doc and I scrambled up the tunnel into the light above. Hey everybody, thanks for listening to Smoking Fairy Tales Chapter 6. I'd like to thank my voice actors, Nicholas Daughtry, Paul E., Eric Pickle, Chuck Lavaki, and Matt Kepsky Kavishish. Kikavishish. Kikavishish. Kepsky Kavishish. I'm not pronouncing that. Anyway, thank you to my Patreon supporters and people who have gotten the war chest, which, you know, is the first six books of the Smoke Pit Fairy Tale series and a custom painted ammo can with some cards and a stickers and a patch and all that. I'm sure I've talked your ear off about that kind of thing. All right, you all have a good one. I'll catch you around.